Good evening, my viewers. This is George On Deck with the latest edition of the George On Deck Show. I'm in beautiful Peekskill. Um, it's becoming a very cosmopolitan city, and today I'm presenting the best parts of it. I'm on Stowe Road, just below where I live at Society Hill 2. I'm in a historic building. As you can see, beautiful flowers and beautiful people in the background. And this is Peekskill, New York. And um, I'm going to be interviewing Mike Bennett this morning. Mike is a radio personality. Him and Casey Morabito have been on WHUD for the past 20 years. And I've been on public access cable for almost the same length of time. I've just entered my 19th year. And um, OK, we look forward to seeing Mike Bennett. He will be promoting his current book. Um, he has a book about his years in radio. Um, okay, once again, this is George On Deck with a show from Cosmopolitan Peekskill, New York. All of my vi vi visitors who watch the show should come visit Peekskill. We've just recently upgraded Riverfront Green uh, with a $6 million facelift and new boardwalk. We also have the Lincoln Museum in Peekskill, an art museum and restaurant, restaurant Row. Last summer we had a fashion show and every Saturday and Sunday night we closed down Bank Street and it becomes Restaurant Row where people can dine and have a good time in Peekskill. Okay, we'll go into the Field Library now and we'll meet Mr. Mr. Bennett, Mike Bennett from WHUD. Thank you. I'm now uh, in downtown historic Peekskill. I'm in front of the Field Library, one of our, our uh, famous buildings, a historic building. That's where Mike Bennett will be uh, appearing today with his book. We're now panning over to a historic building in Peekskill, our city hall. It's very historic. You can see the American flags flying in front of it, although one is not on the top staff. We are now going to pan and we are facing the Senator Bernard Gordon Justice Building, that's our city court and our fine police department. And if Mike uh, pans further, you'll see our historic art loft buildings where many artists who have now resided in Peekskill uh, reside and do their uh, artwork and from what I understand 50 more art lofts have been proposed for Peekskill and it's becoming a very artistic city. We have a um, we have a art museum here on Route 6 and it's promoting love throughout the world for the next month and a half and people throughout the county should call it and make reservations and they can see presentations, artists and, and uh, along with the love theme. Thank you. I'm very honored now to have on the Get On Deck show with George On Deck, Mike Bennett. Uh, host of the morning show on WHUD, along with Casey Morbido. How many years have you been doing that show? Uh, we're now in our 16th year together, and uh, I know you've been doing this longer on cable TV, so yeah. you're, the, you're the record that we're shooting for, George. Well, I'm only on public access cable TV. You're on big time radio, WHUD. Well, You're doing a tremendous job every Well, week. so are you. I mean, you've been at this for 19 years now on cable, and I'm sure you have a lot of dedicated followers who like to see what your adventure takes you next. Yes, because my adventures, my followers see me in about a million homes from Yonkers up to Mayapack, including Bedford, um, Chappaqua, and... Uh, on YouTube all over the world, Mike. So you're going to be seen all over the world today. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. But, Michael, what got you into being now an author? I know you're a great radio personality. Well, I always had a lot of radio stories because I've been doing it for over 40 years. And people kept telling me, oh, you should write a book. You should write a book. That story should be in a book. So that's what we did. Now, Michael, I have a bucket list. We talked about me being 39 before, yeah. you said. Or was it 105 I mentioned? One of these days, I have to write a book, and one of these days, I have to be on radio. What should I do about that, Michael? 
write a book about how much you want to be on the radio. Yes. And then hope that somebody takes you up on it. Hey, there and you go. Attach some money to it. Now, how does one sit down and write a book, Mike? Well, actually, what you do is you get together with a guy who's your high school buddy who writes books for a living, and you pick his brain. Uh huh. And then basically, the book is based on a uh, talk I gave at Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh. Uh -huh. I was invited to speak to the communication uh, majors. And I spoke, they wanted me to speak for 15 minutes. I went on for an hour and a half. Wow. And they videotaped it and put it up on YouTube. Wow. And so we took a lot of the material from that. And, Mike, in the past you told me you wouldn't come on TV because you had a face for radio. And that's totally untrue. I saw you on your ad about a bank, and you were tremendous. Oh, yes. Well, and that was all ad lib, George, which you know all about, right? Because you ad lib everything <laughs> that, on That's your all show. I ever do is Right. Ad There's no script you involved. Don't see I know the people watching this can't believe this, but this is totally unscripted. It's totally unscripted. Uh, uh, up until five minutes ago. I'm I didn't even know who you were. I didn't know who you were. And I'm were. not exactly. Could I see some ID, by the but way? But I think we're both pulling each other's legs right I here. I didn't touch him. My hands are above the table. But, Mike, let's talk more about the book. Um, All right, How fine. long did it take you to write it? About and, two years. And why should people read this book? Well, it's titled Don't Pay the Ransom, I've Escaped, which was a <laughs> title I had in my mind for a long time. And when I say, every time I say it, it gets a laugh, just like what you did. Right. And so... The guy I was working with said, that's got to be the title. It's a funny, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't really mean anything. And there's no explanation in the book for the title, by the way. So if you buy the book, you're never going to find it. But the subtitle is Memories of a Life on the Radio. And that's really what it's all about. It's all about different stories, different uh, problems, issues, fun, achievements in radio over 40 years. Now, what a lot of people may not know is you do five hours a day on radio from 5 in the morning till... 5.30 in the morning till about 10 o'clock every yeah, day? Yeah, about four and a half hours a day. And we do that uh, five days a week with Casey. And then on Saturday, I have my own show. And then for a while, I work Sundays for uh, Shadow Traffic. I was doing traffic And, and then you go out on appearances like right. uh, I do uh, interviews. wagon whisker walks and stuff like that. Uh, right. Car dealerships. and Right. And sometimes they... The, uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I did their yeah. ball last night. Yeah. It was a yeah. fantastic success. Raise lots of money for great kids. Support connection you help, I know, sometimes. Uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, when they ask me. The I'll tell you a funny story about Go support ahead, connection. Mike. Yes. I filled in one time at their walk in Yorktown at FDR Park for Casey. Right. She couldn't make it. She's always there. She's been there every year before and every year since. But this particular year, about five or six years ago, I show up to fill in on a Sunday morning, my only day off, 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's raining. It's pouring. And as I get out of my car, the first person I see says, you know, when Casey's the MC, it has never <laughs> rained. And I said, well, thank you. You're welcome. I'm here. Thanks. I said, I think it would have been raining even if she was here because it's raining. I didn't bring the rain. So I got off to kind of a bad start that day. Mike, I brought the rain with me. Mike, in the past, they used to advertise it as the wag and whiskers walk. I'm a big cat lover, and I've hardly ever seen any cats there, but now I think they call it just the doggy walk. Okay. I, I think with all those dogs, the cats were afraid to come or something? I think so. <laughs> I'm getting a little afraid myself. <laughs> so what is it like to work with that wonderful person, Casey? I think you see her more than her husband sees her. You're on the air so much together. Oh, yeah, no, we, we, uh, we, we are all on the air a lot together, and her husband does come to the studio yes, from Mr. time Gruen, to time. Do I say Green. his Green. Green, yeah. Mike? And uh, she met him a few years ago, and then they got married, and it was wonderful. And, uh, yeah, he stops by sometimes, and right. uh, he's always welcome. He's a big sports fan and great guy. And, Mike, how do you feel about being in my home city of Peekskill, New York, today and at this wonderful library, the Field Library in Peekskill? Well, I love the Field Library. I used to come here for a lot of different events when I was in the news department back in the day and when we were based out of Peekskill. So this is like old home week. I drove around the block six times trying to figure out how to park. But other than that, it's a great place, and we're happy to be here. Okay, so now I guess you're going to explain about your book, I'll Move Aside, and this vast audience we have here will uh, be hearing about your book. And the how vast audience here or the vast audience watching at home? Well, I hope at, at home and uh, throughout the world on YouTube. Is there a website for your fan club, uh, George? Yes, it's called George0421 at AOL.com. That's where my, uh, they can contact me at. 
Very good. Now, Thank how you, can people contact you if they want to buy the book? Well, they can buy the book at Amazon.com. There's some nice reviews, about 17, 18 reviews. And uh, it's available in Kindle and paperback. And uh, that's the best way to do it. Or just wait till I come to their town because I'm going to go to everybody's town eventually. And, Mike, it's been great having you on the air uh, about 25 hours a week in Peekskill. But it's great seeing you in person. George, it was a lot of fun. You're a good guy. You are too, sir. Yeah. I, I try to look at the light side of things. You know, that's been my whole life. I, I, in high school, I was voted the wittiest. I mean, it wasn't much of a competition, but still. And so I'd like to think that I've carried that forward and brought it to the public. So um, it, it's, it's lighthearted. It's a very easy read, obviously. Uh, I read it every night. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. We're planning to do another one. We're not quite sure how it's going to take shape or if it will ever come to fruition. But I've thought of so many stories since we wrote the book. It's one of those things where, you know, and, and, I, say, and I can't remember now because I've told so many stories whether or not it's in the book. There's stories in here about the beginning of the Maria Ferrer Children's Hospital and how that came to be and my involvement with it. There's stories about Casey uh, working with her. There's stories about um, life in the Hudson Valley, West Point, uh, Warwick, and that kind of thing, you know, places that I've been that I really loved. And it's about my family and how much they mean to me and things like that. So that's what it is. It's a heartwarming book. It's funny, I think. And uh, it was a, a labor of love when we put this together. We would meet for lunch out in Danbury. You ever a place called Rosie's to, Rosie Tomorrow's oh, yes. in Danbury? He lives in Fairfield, Connecticut, and I live in Beacon. So we kind of, it was sort of equidistant, not really, but we just fell in love with the place. So we go in there, we have our, we even mentioned the name of our waitress in the back of the book, Rebecca, because she waited on us every time. And we'd just sit around for like two and a half, three hours. He would tape, tape me and we would just laugh about things. We've been friends since high school. And in high school, this fellow, Mike Barlow, and I wrote all the, like we had a class skit every year. We would write that and perform it <coughs> along with other people. But I mean, we would do the writing. So he's been a, a writer for a long, long time. He was a reporter, became a writer, and uh, he's been pub he published like 16, 17 books. But this is the one that I think he's had the most fun with because we've gotten a lot of fun people to hold it up with me, you know, a lot of celebrities and stuff, including Jay Leno, obviously, because that's on here. But there's a lot more, there's like 40 of them. And each time, like Carol Burnett was the latest when she was in White Plains. When I say the uh, the title of the book, when I did the interview with her over the phone, she just laughed out loud. I mean, it, it usually draws a laugh, not always, but sometimes. <coughs> and, um, and then when I actually met her and presented her with the book, she took several pictures with me and stuff. So it always gets a pretty good laugh, reaction. And the reason we put Leno on there, when I did an interview with Leno before he was at I Call at West Point, when I answered the phone, the first thing he said to me was, how's your book going? Now, I, you know, I'm not quite sure how he knew. Maybe he just saw my bio, I don't know. But he said, how's your book going? And I said, oh, it's going pretty well. He goes, I love that title, Don't Pay the Ransom, I've Escaped. And all of this unprompted by me. I didn't even bring it up. I was just going to talk about I Call. And he says, I was just saying that the other day. You never see a movie where they say, okay, they paid the ransom, let them go, you know. <laughs> I said, well, that, that's the whole, the, you know, and he got it. So, <coughs> pardon me. So, anyway, we got he got a kick out of it. And, of course, I took that little clip, even though I didn't use it on the air, I took that clip and sent it to my friend, and he got the biggest kick out of it. You know, Jay Leno was talking about this book. So, um, it's been a, you know, it's, it's not going to be on the bestseller list. I haven't made a dime off of it. No, I wasn't never looking to make any money off of it. We're just, you know, paying the cost of putting it out. But it has been a blast. You know, it was like years ago, my two brothers and my sister and I, at the Paramount in Peekskill, the guy who ran the Paramount at the time came to me. He said, you know, you should put on a show. You should be the producers of a show. And he said, oh, okay. And we'd all just come into a little bit of an inheritance, all four of us, from our late stepfather. So we said, we'll all put in 5000 I think that's what it was, 5000 each. So we had 20000 just enough to strangle ourselves on it. And we became a production company called MVP, Mid Valley Productions. We had shirts made up for our staff, you know, which was all our kids and our cousins. And we put on three shows at the Paramount and Peekskill. The worst thing that happened to us was that the first show was a huge success. So we thought we were, you know, this is easy pickets. We had 
Bowser's Rock and Roll Christmas Party. It was a pre-packaged show you bought. Bowser from Sha Na Na was the host, and then he would bring, you know, five or six acts. And we had uh, the Marvelettes, and we had uh, Lou Christie, the guy who sang real uh, falsetto. Anyway, we had a great lineup, and Paramount holds about a thousand people. We had two shows in one night. We sold like 1,700 tickets out of 2,000, which was incredible. You know, we couldn't believe it. We got a temporary beer license. We had a beer concession on the second floor run by my nephews. You know, we, we pulled out all the stops. We did everything. And uh, we made money because even with our startup costs and printing and a bank account and checks and everything, we still had money left over. So that was the, the fatal mistake. We thought, oh, this is so easy. So then we put on another show, and that was kind of fair to Midland results. And then the, finally the third show, we lost everything that we had left. And we, it wasn't that the show was bad, it just it didn't sell. But the, the point I was I'm making about this book, this will never make anybody any money. It certainly hasn't made me a dime, and I'm not looking for it. But just like the produced shows, we still laugh and talk about those three nights and the, leading up to it. That's our family communal thing that we talk about every time we get together. Because it was just so hysterical. Like my brother Bill, he now is in Las Vegas, we called him the schmoozer. He was the guy... I did, like, I was the president, so I booked all the shows. My brother's an attorney, so he ended all the contracts, and you can imagine the riders on these contracts. You hear about that stuff? It's all true. We were crossing out, you know, only black m and and we're crossing, he's just crossing things out. And then my sister was kind of a silent partner because she's in Virginia, and she would just come up for the shows. Anyway, my brother, the schmoozer, like, we're putting on the show with Bowser and the, and the Marvelettes, and I'm thinking of this because it's right down the street at, at Paramount. And we're all like, where's Bill? Where's my brother Bill? We're all looking around for Bill. We open up the, we knock on the door, and one of the Marvelettes, who's like half-dressed, opens up the door, and there's my brother sitting with the three Marvelettes with champagne. Now, you know, we should have just figured that out, because it was Bill. But that's the kind of person he was. When they did Don't Mess With Bill, he came out on stage and danced with them. He says, I'm a producer. I can do whatever I want. So we laugh at the stories and the camaraderie that we felt in those three shows. Uh, so that's my where my heart is in Peekskill is at the Paramount and basically downtown because I would be down here almost every night covering a meeting or doing whatever. Those are my reporting days. That ended in 2000 when I moved over to become a disc jockey. So I'm one of the few people, if you look through the history of radio, not that I, you know, I'm claiming this as a title, but not many people do 28 years as a news director, not just a reporter, but most of the time as a news director, and then switch over and have a successful career as a disc jockey. I had never really been a disc jockey before, although in high school and in training, I had always thought that that's what I would do. Because my brother-in-law, God rest his soul, he just died last year, he was in radio and he was a news guy. And I always thought to myself, well, he would do the news and I'll do the, because I love music, and I, I'd be the disc jockey. But when the opening came after I graduated from that uh, mountain of uh, education, the announcer training studios in Manhattan, which no longer exists, Manhattan exists, but announcer training studios has gone by the boards. Yeah, I was in there for an intensive three months and graduated with honors, and also I paid the bills, so they let me graduate. And the first job opening that I got was in Hyde Park, New York, and it involved uh, being a salesman during the day, but then it, on the weekends, they would put me on the, the news. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but I, it was a foot in the door. I had no experience. So that's what I did. And when I did my first newscast, I can remember it almost like it was yesterday. It was 1972. And I really killed it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can say that now in all modesty, but I mean, I really was good. And it was a top 40 type thing. It was real fast paced. And at the end of the thing, you had to say, and repeating the big story, you know, fire in Poughkeepsie, I'm Mike Bennett on 95 WHVW. Now more with Nielsen, whatever it was that I had to say and I hit it right on time and everything was perfect and I didn't fall apart and I sounded good and I remember the program director walked in and he was never there on Saturday but he was there that Saturday he says that was really good he said forget about this sales stuff you don't know what you're doing with that but on the air you're pretty good I'll give you one quick sales story they sent me out talk about a non-salesman my ter we were in Hyde Park and I don't know if you know geographically that's right there the culinary is in Hyde Park Culinary Institute and my territory for sales was Kingston, which is across the river and up about 20 minutes, right? 
They couldn't even hear us in Kingston, this little station. But that was my sales territory, you know, because I was the new guy. And they wanted to see if I could sell. Well, I couldn't sell, but I didn't want to tell them that because that was my job. I go out on my first sales call, and I got my little suit and tie, and I have no clue what I'm doing. But they tell me to go to this, you know, Jones's lumber yard, this big lumber yard, where all these contractors are pulling in there before Home Depot and Lowe's and all that. And I walked in, and my opening line was, and salespeople always get hysterical when they hear what I said. I walked up to the guy, and I said, are you, you know, you're the general manager? He said, yeah. I said, I'm Mike from WHVW. I said, you don't want to buy radio advertising, do you? <laughs> Just like that. And he said, nope. And I said, okay, I'll be back in six months just to check. And I went out in the car and I wrote a note. I said, not interested in radio advertising at this time. We'll check back in six months, you know, and I wrote down the place. And that was part of my report that I, I gave back to them. And they were like, oh, he really wasn't interested? I said, no, I don't know why. <laughs> so I was the worst salesman. And that really was the only sales call I went on. I didn't have the guts to get out of the car after that. Because I had no idea, I had no training. They basically just were filling a position. We had one guy went out on a sales call in the morning, got a flat tire, called and says, I quit. I'm changing my tire, but I don't want to do this anymore. We had another guy who collected cash from the client and then skipped the county. So um, we had a, you know, we put up an employee list in the morning, and by the afternoon, there'd be like six people across them. Um, so it was a fun place to work. It was a little farmhouse on Route 9G. And uh, I worked with, you know, the name John Gambling. He's back on radio now. He retired briefly, but he's back. And his father was alive then. Even his grandfather was alive then. But John worked at the little station I was at. And we had just gotten brand new push-button controls. And we also had a basement. It was an old farmhouse. And so the basement had mice and rats. So they, they got a station cat, Edna Katz. <laughs> and Edna Katz was in the basement most of the time, chasing all the vermin. Well, John is upstairs, and it's, I'm in the newsroom, I'm typing away on the old typewriters, and John goes to the men's room, which was really a unisex room, and all of a sudden I hear in my head, you know, this commercial plan, because he's in the bathroom, there's going to be another commercial, I hear the other, the other commercial starts, that stops, another one comes on in the middle, and then a jingle, and then that stops, and then another commercial, and that stops, and another commercial, then a song, and that stops, I'm like, what, is John having a stroke, what's going on? And I hear John running up the stairs, because you can hear that all in the building, you can hear what's going on. Edna Katz was walking across the board, and, and the weight was just enough to turn it on and off and on and off, all the way down the line, like eight different control panels. So, and you know, it's, and I swear to God, I was there, that's a true story. I told that to somebody who worked with John. Yeah, I said, Tell, ask him about Edna Katz. And I'm, I'm setting him up, and then I told him the story. I said, but he's gonna roll around on the floor saying, how do you know about Edna Katz? Didn't remember it at all. Claimed it never happened, but I was there. And it really did happen. And we had just gotten those kind of buttons, because before that, it was something that a cat wouldn't even, uh, you know, wouldn't even matter. But the push button on and off was just enough of a cat. So those are my days in radio. That was the start. I don't even know if that story's in the book. I don't think it is. Um, but we had a fun time. John, John, he had, you know, he was a well-to-do family. His, he, he was the third in a lineage of radio royalty, so he had a DeLorean back in the day, you know, and they opened up on the side, and the sides of the car came up almost like perpendicular, and you didn't see them every day in downtown uh, Poughkeepsie. So John and I are going to lunch one day at McDonald's, all of a sudden we get pulled over by two cops, and we were just like 20 miles an hour. The mayor is here? I don't need to interrupt. No, I'm touched. Thank you, man. How are you? All right, Catalina. You know Mayor Catalina? Congratulations, yeah. Listen to me. Mayor. Mayor Catalina, how are you, sir? I'm good. Congratulations. I just told a great story about the Paramount. Oh, yeah? Yeah, how we used to produce shows. Is this your first book? Yes, it is my first book. And as I said, it's about to be my last. Oh, why your last? No, no, I'm just teasing. Oh, congratulations. Oh, that's very nice of you to show up. I just wanted to come over and say congratulations. I didn't know you were an author on top of everything else. I'll just listen to what you have to say. Yes, George. Mike, you made these anecdotes so interesting. I'd like to buy one of your books right okay. now, but only if you'll sign it. Oh, absolutely. And you I want to close right out my show. All right, cool. Close out your show, George, because I'm about done. Pictures? Your anecdotes you about your son. In your basement? I heard that's what you did on the Reminded side. me a little oh, yeah. bit of me, Mike. Um, really? I met a couple of celebrities since I've been doing this show right. for 19 years. And I was painfully shy. You'll never believe That's this. hard to believe. But as a Vietnam vet, 
I took a speech course at Westchester Community College and came out of my shell. And a lot of people would wish that goes back in that yeah, shell. Yeah, you, if you <laughs> come back, that'd be great. Um, but I met a Donald Trump once oh, at a, a great guy. ribbon he's a cutting ceremony. Fantastic guy. And I said, Mr. Trump, um, I'd like you to do me a favor. Uh -huh. He says, well, who are you? I says, I'm George. And he said, what do you want? I says, I want to be fired by you. Oh, okay, sure. So he, he smiled and he said, George, you're, you're fired. fired. And the other big celebrity I met was Eli Manning. Oh, yeah. He's um, going to be in town on Monday night if you want to go see him. Oh, where at? Mulinos and White Plains for the oh, uh, very good Guiding restaurant. Eyes for the Blind. Yeah. You won't believe this. You should go down there. You'd, you'd really fit in with all the uh, press corps. By the way, um, it's ama amazing that you mentioned Molinos. When I was first back from Vietnam, I worked as a midnight to eight security guard in a big hotel in White Plains, and the restaurant downstairs was Molino's. See, it all ties together. If you talk long enough, it goes in a but big But the circle. thing with Eli, what a nice person. Very nice guy. That's where I met him. And that, Guiding Eyes for the Blind. Yep. It was a golf tournament yeah, well, that's that what he he's donated yep. all his services. Right. He was a down-to-earth person, Mike. Right. No security people. Well, now and he does. I asked him one question, Mike. You win two Mike, Super Bowls, you get security. I said, no, you won two Super Bowls, your father won zero, and your brother won one. At Christmas time, who is the best quarterback in the family when you're talking? And he very diplomatically said, I'm the best quarterback on the Giants. That's your son's team, right? Yeah, that's great. But, Mike, we really want to thank you for coming by Pete Skill today and honoring us with your book. And I want to thank the mayor, Frank Catalina, for dropping by. Yeah, that was very nice. Nice yes, surprise. That was a surprise. Well, thank you very much, George. Okay. I really do appreciate it. And now I want you to do me a favor. Yeah. Close out the George On Deck show. Ladies and On Deck with George. On Deck with George. My God, this is going to be such a great episode. It's going to run for like four nights in a row. Right? How long is the show? A half an hour? A uh, half hour show. Yeah, well, this and is good for you. are about actually, two months worth of tape. It runs tape. three nights in a row. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she's got um, plenty. And listen, George, on oh, deck with George on deck. And how can people reach you, Mike, or reach WHUD if they I'm totally you? off limits to anybody. Oh, okay. no, there's no way you can You're reach me. Off limits, no, no. Right? Listen, I'm on the radio every day. Mike at WHUD.com is my uh, email. And, you know, you can get in touch with me anytime, as you do, George. You call the studio every day. Well, I, I do for birthdays. Yeah. You, people don't. So, ladies and gentlemen, when he isn't on TV, he's trying to get on the radio. He's going to do trying. it one day. You watch. <laughs> on Deck with George On Deck. That's it. Cut. Well, Mike, that's my next career, radio, and to write a book like All you right. and follow in your footsteps. There you go, George. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Buddy. Okay. I'll get him signing. You're lucky you got to the front of the line. <laughs> If anybody else wants to come up, it's... Thank you, George. Thank you so much, Mike. And tell Casey I said hello. I will definitely Any tell grandchildren you. here? I have three grandchildren. Yes. And, and how's your I can't daughter? Make it, I can't make an official announcement yet. But and Mike is so great on the radio. He does personal asides. He lets us know when somebody's graduating, yeah, yeah, yeah. getting married, when he's having heart surgery. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hi, right, George. You're welcome.